My name is Sammy Ajaz, and you guys are watching Hustle Politics. Joining us today is the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production, uh, also the MPP of Brampton South, Prab Sarkaria. Prab, how are you? I'm great, uh, Sammy. Thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to come in front of your uh, viewers and your listeners, and uh, uh, really appreciate that, uh, and, and looking forward to our conversation today. Well, thank you for your time, and I want to take you right back to, you know, where you were born, where'd you grow up, where'd you go to school? Tell me all about you. So, you know, very quickly, I am uh, I was actually born and raised in Orangeville, Ontario. So that was my, uh, uh, I probably spent my first uh, uh, 20 years of my life there and then ended up moving to, to Brampton afterwards. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, I'm a Mayfield Maverick alumni and uh, went off to uh, a school at uh, Wilfrid Laurier where I did my BBA uh, in uh, uh, focused on finance and ended up after uh, doing my undergraduate working at TD Bank for a bit and then decided that I wanted to uh, get into law and um, pursued a law degree at the University of Windsor, uh, where after I articled with Miller Thompson and I focused a lot in um, corporate law, so corporate commercial, a lot of mergers and acquisition, uh, private equity finance and type of uh, work um, through my law career. And so um, and then, you know, I was always uh, during these times of, and trying to stay as much connected as I could to the community. Uh, and we all know that in order to do that, you, you know, you've really got to try to, um, whether it's volunteer for NGOs, uh, volunteer for um, uh, different groups, um, you know, that was something. I'm a big sports fan, so I always tried to uh, incorporate the sports uh, and charity together. I had the opportunity to kind of launch this initiative called Hockey for Humanity, where we were um, you know, uh, playing a, an annual ball hockey tournament, which saw over probably, um, you know, hundreds of players and went from a, a tournament of a couple of teams to hundreds of players uh, very quickly over the couple of years. And we, we saw a bunch of, we were raising money for, for charities across Canada and a, a, across the world. So I had a neat opportunity to, to kind of um, do a lot of community work as well. And, and that's really what led me into to politics because I, I knew, you know, there's an opportunity to, to make some change in the province, wasn't happy with the course of the correction, wasn't happy with what the future was looking like under the, the previous government. So I thought I'd uh, take the opportunity to step up and uh, have an opportunity to, to contribute and give back and also um, change the way uh, that, uh, you know, change the course of Ontario for the better. What would you say is your, like your most favorite thing about Brampton South? I think it's the people. Uh, I'm Brampton, uh, you know, my community of Brampton South is probably one of the most diverse. Um, you know, we've got people from every corner of the world in that riding. It's, uh, you know, if you break it down, um, you know, there's about 100 and now about 120,000 people living there. But, you know, there's the, the, there's the Muslim community, there's the Sikh community, the Hindu community, there's a huge Portuguese community. Um, uh, Iranian community. It is, every community is uh, in my riding, and I have the opportunity, uh, you know, just to to learn so much. You know, you get outside of your bubble at, at, a, at a certain time, and you get to experience other cultures. You get to interact with so many different people, and that really kind of gives you uh, an understanding of you know what Canada really is. It's just about bringing people together, giving them the opportunity to really succeed, and I think that's the the best part of our country. Um, and it doesn't matter what you're faith is it doesn't matter uh you know where you came from who you worship you know everybody has an opportunity to succeed in this province right now Bra uh, brampton south what would you say is the front burner concern in brampton south that everybody's talking about so you know outside of the con context of covid right now i think everything is so much covid focused but let's go back a couple of months and i think one of the biggest issues were in the province, and I think we were dealing with it systemically across, you know, many different regions. But, uh, you know, Brampton was really left behind in terms of healthcare, And that was really one of the key considerations. You know, you look at the record of the previous government, um, given the population growth that Brampton had, it just, you know, you can give, you look at any region where there's been high population growth, um, the funding just never kept uh, pace for that. So, you know, our government made a commitment to, to end hallway healthcare. And we've been working with uh, our partners at William Oscar to see how that can happen. Um, you know, diverting money from administrative costs to frontline healthcare was a start that our government took right off the right off the bat in the first year. Um, and you know, in, investing in long-term care homes. You know, if you look at from 2011 to 2018, the previous government, I think, built 650 beds, um, long-term care beds. In the first year of government, we were able to 
announced just 330 uh, new and uh, refurbished beds just in Brampton alone. We announced over. So, so would you say that was a decision sort of on a provincial level, or the transfers came from the federal level? So you know, you you talk about the previous Liberal government. So explain to me, you know, what what, what do you think they did that you guys did right and they did wrong in regards to they, the uh, understanding of the demands? So where, where where were the transfers? Was it provincial transfers or was it uh, federal transfers? No, these are all provincial. Like, you know, it's, it's about priorities. You know, what, what was the priority of the previous government? They racked up and left this province with $15 billion deficits per year. They, we were the most indebted subnational government in the world. So we've got a, a debt of over $340 billion before we even took over. And that only happened over the past 15 years. So when you look at all that money that was spent, you know, you, you've, you're running deficits in, a good, in, in good economic times for that matter. At $15 billion a year, you're racking up the highest subnational debt of any government in the entire world. And what do we have to show for it? A broken healthcare, a broken healthcare system that they left us with on life support, no infrastructure uh, that uh, we need, lack of infrastructure, transportation, you know, um, a lacking uh, commute times at an all time high. Um, the system was broken, and what they were, their priorities were just not in line with, with what the priorities of this province and the people of this province wanted. And that's where we came in. That's why the people elected us, and we had a strong mandate to change. And uh, you know, I'm very confident in the, in the steps that we've been able to take to 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 foster that change. So, Prab, let's talk about that 15 billion dollar figure uh, that you say that you know the previous government left us with. So, you know, I was reading the financial accountability because I'm 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 sort of like a numbers type of guy. I love I love politics. I you know being an anchor. The first uh, financial accountability officer projected that Ontario's budget deficit uh, was to increase to 8.5 billion in 2019-2020, up from uh, 7.4 billion in 2018. So, as you said, you know what the 15 billion dollar um, deficit. So, how do you compare that 7.4 billion dollar number against the 15 billion? That's twice as much as 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 you're saying. So, a lot of people say that you know the PC government had inflated that number. How what, how would you comment on uh, those individuals that uh, would say that that number is inflated, that 15 billion dollar number? So there's a couple elements to that uh, when we look at that uh, number. So the 15 billion number was a rise at an independent commission uh, that came to that number. And what we knew with the previous government, what they were doing is they were, you know, look at the debt uh, that they were hiding. Uh, you know, basically um, it was government owed debt, like the hydro scheme that we all talk about. They took four billion plus dollars of government money, um, of taxpayer hard earned money. Uh, and they put it into a different corporation. But at the end of the day, that money is still owed to is still owed by the corporation, or sorry, by the people of Ontario. Um, when we look at you know further revisions to, to that deficit number, um, you know, we saw you know three hundred thousand new jobs being created under this government after we took over in eighteen months. So we were also able to improve uh, business revenue. You know, the, the revenue that the government was taking in. Um, if you look down a year after that and, and what the deficits were, um, you know, when you look at that second number of nine billion, eight point four billion, um, that was a year after the government took many measures um, uh, and, and looked at efficiency, um, or looked at where government needed to prioritize its spending, um, or looked at the increase of revenue, whether it was coming from personal taxes, whether it was coming from business taxes, that was all higher. So that but what we need to focus on in that $15 billion number comes from when we inherited what the government was spending and what the government had undertaken. And that number was so, very So, so Prime, my, my take is this, though, right? Mission. Would you say that the FAO didn't do their job properly, where that $4 billion that should have been added to the 7.4 to add up to, you know, a couple of other, you know, debts that the Liberal uh, government left us with, would you say they weren't doing their job or would you say that they may have missed out on something or were the liberals that good at hiding that $4 billion number? Because that $4 billion number is quite a big of a number, right? So how so would you comment on that? There's, so there's a def different elements to not just only the, the hydro number, the, the, four, the, the $4 billion scheme that they had uh, come up with. Um, but the number that you're referencing is, is from the year after as well. I think if you look at the FAO's report, uh, um, I, they, there's there's different there's different reports that came out at different periods of time for different uh, economic uh, uh, I would say cycles as well as times. Um, so when you look at the original reports and, and so a lot of the re the reports that you're actually also referencing, I, I believe came after and I can you know we can double check it after, but it came after the government's year of um, uh, you know spending uh, 
and, yeah, and that's exactly what it is. So it came out in the 19, but, but it, yeah, it so said that 15... 7.4 billion was in the 18 uh, fiscal year, right? So, you know, that's, that's interesting where, you know, uh, maybe they've missed out on something, right? Uh, that could so, be. And I think that's why it was very important for our government when we came in. But, you know, we wanted to see what was in the books. And that's why there was an independent commission that was uh, led by the former premier, liberal premier of uh, you know, British Columbia, uh, who was at, actually with him and his team. Uh, you know, I was also on the, uh, the, the, the chair of the Financial Transparency Committee, which was a, a special committee struck up uh, for this purpose. And we had the opportunity. But it really comes down to, you know, the mismanagement of the previous government. Uh, we'll look at the priorities. Uh, we'll look at what, you know, they were spending their money on and what were we as taxpayers getting in return. A broken healthcare system. Uh, look at, you know, regions like Brampton struggling. Uh, no investments there. Uh, look at our long-term care centers. We've got, thir you know, waiting lists in excess of uh, 30,000. Our government committed to 15,000 in five years, of, of which, you know, before COVID, we were already at uh, close to 6,000 new beds. Um, uh, you look at the infrastructure across this province. We had we announced the, the largest investment probably in, in a subway line in Ontario, uh, almost a $30 billion project. You look at where the money was spent, you look at the debt that was accumulated by the previous government, and you really wonder, where does that money go? Where was it not? Why was it not spent in our communities? Why is our uh, healthcare system not better than it is? And that's really where we needed to focus on making sure that, you know, money, when we look at healthcare, money should not be going to administrative costs. As a province, over 30% of our administrative, uh, sorry, 30% of our healthcare costs on average is higher in administrative than any other province in, uh, in, in the country. Right. And that's unacceptable because that money should be going towards our uh, frontline healthcare workers, hospitals, doctors. Uh, uh, and that's really where, where we will see the changes, a fundamental shift in the way the, the government uh, uh, operates. You brought up uh, frontline uh, workers and, and, you know, I know that residents of Ontario have declared them as heroes because they're doing so much uh, for the province. Would you say the Doug Ford government is doing enough for the frontline workers? I think, look, there's been, um, you know, we were the first province to institute pandemic pay uh, for our frontline workers. There's, you know, we owe an immense gratitude to our frontline healthcare workers, um, but the amount of sacrifice they're putting, they're on the front lines of COVID. It's like, you right. know, they are the ones dealing with COVID patients left, right, and center. But this province has come a long way uh, because of what our frontline healthcare workers have been able to, what our, um, uh, what Ontarians as individuals have been able to do. they followed all you have to do is look south of the border. Um, look at the, the oh, yeah, difference between the it's south it's of the border. And, and look south at what of the border been. is crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's a, that's a whole it, new world. I, th I, th I think we could take that world and put the entire world on the other side. You're like that. We, we still don't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it really speaks to like how everyone has bought into it. Right in the U.S., right. you know, you you know, the frontline healthcare workers are doing an incredible job, and they're going to keep, keep doing that job. But if the people aren't listening. Then it makes, you know, the frontline healthcare workers, they're at risk. Doctors are at risk even more. But look at Ontario. You know, we've come down to uh, today's I, I, like 100 uh, and so cases per day now, right? It's, it's a significant decline. And that's because people are listening. People are taking the precaution. We've seen regions across the province that are made uh, mandatory masks now. And people are listening. It's not like, you know, uh, for the most part. And that's why the numbers have been able to come down. Everyone has played such a critical role. Um, in this and, and, and led by our frontline healthcare workers who have been doing incredible work. So uh, tell me something. Um, what are the next steps uh, in opening up existing small businesses in Ontario? So what's the time frame? sort of like guide me through it. I know, you know, phase two has uh, phase three has opened up in certain areas of Ontario. Uh, phase two is still implying and, you know, Brampton, Milton and, and the GTA concept. So what would be the next step for uh, opening up small local businesses? So, um, as we look into, we've taken a regional approach once again uh, towards the the reopening of our, uh, I would say, uh, small like the, the small businesses that or businesses in general that haven't been able to open to date. Uh, that includes dine-in portions of restaurants, uh, gyms, um, etc., uh, and other activities. And really, what it's related to is monitoring of the data. And so, you know, when we look into the the, the region that we've released today, or sorry, yesterday, and that's going to be in, in effect for this week. Uh, it's based on four weeks of data. So these areas have very low ca case counts. Uh, and it's based off of advice from the chief medical officer primarily. Um, and, and so as, the, as, you know, as we go into next week now, we'll be into four weeks for the next region and then four weeks for the Peel region and four weeks for, you know, um, uh, 
for the Windsor Essex area. And that, that's really important for us to be able to look at the data. And, and that from that data, you know, there's uh, certain elements uh, that we take into consideration. So, you know, as a stage three, you can see that, you know, amusement parks are still not open because the government and the public health officials will still believe that at this current moment, uh, it's a safe thing to do. But we are going to be opening up, you know, dine-in restaurants with a physical distancing, of course. Of course. So um, even, uh, you know, gyms at 50% capacity. But, you know, it's not, new, it's not, it's not going to be as normal as it was before. And that's because we still got a lot, quite a bit of way to go and we don't want to see the infections increase again and then uh, look at other jurisdictions across the world where, which have had to do another lockdown or have, have to do a shutdown or rein, um, reinvent the wheel kind of. So, you know, we've made a lot of sacrifices. Uh, governments have put up a lot of money towards supporting our small businesses. You know, our hearts go out to all the business owners that have you know, been struggling uh, immensely through this uh, process. Um, but we've seen the sacrifice that we've made uh, as individuals in this province, um, we've seen it come forward in terms of better numbers and an opportunity to open up this economy um, uh, like we want to get back to that somewhat uh, right. normal that we, we all want to be back to from post-COVID. Briefly talking a little bit about education as sort of like, you, you know, you know, get it, slipping you out of the Associate Minister of Small Businesses and taking you right into the MPP of uh, Brampton South. Education, uh, you know, we've we seen a cut to... Uh, university in York, uh, York University in Markham, Ryerson in Brampton, you know, Laurier and Conestoga in Milton. How would you respond to, I mean, you're an MPP for Brampton. How would you respond to the residents of Brampton South and Brampton in general uh, with the university cut? Would, would that correlate to a uh, sort of like fixing the deficit in budget or, you know, where, where was that sort of decision drawn and how did you feel as the MPP, you know, feeling, you know, we have this coming, but now there's a cut to it. So how, you know, you talked about a little bit of healthcare, but now, you know, shifting gears to education, how would you respond to the residents of uh, sort of Brampton South on this cut that has happened directly in Brampton, actually? Uh, so, you know, with this specific issue, this was something that, you know, you, you look at what the previous government's legacy was on, on a file like this. Two weeks before an election uh, is supposed to be called, they say, you know, they're going to build three new universities. Uh, they had 15 years to build these universities. But when you actually look at it, not a single dollar was actually spent by the government on any of these universities. So then you look at the economic fiscal time of the matter. You look at the deficits, you look at the budget, you look at the debt that's been created by the previous government. And you have to put some of these projects on hold uh, because it's in the best interest of this province. Look, if we weren't able to take the measures we took in the first year of this government, our ability to react to what COVID and the ability to spend, you know, in tough times like COVID right now and as the economy is declining, we probably wouldn't have those opportunities. It's because of our sound fiscal prudence and the, the, the steps that we took uh, to prioritize government spending that we are now able in a better position to be able to support our economy in a tough time. You know, what kind of government, uh, what kind of fiscal uh, prudence is it for a government to be running, you know, billions and billions of dollars of debt uh, when the economy is on fire? Uh, you know, when you look at the previous government, you know, you, you went through some strong fiscal period um, of growth, economic growth across the province, uh, but we were still racking up higher debts. That's not fiscal. But, you know, the steps that our government took, you know, allowed us to be in a better position to be able to respond to an instance like COVID. When we look at small business owners, we look at, you know, being able to give out close to a billion dollars in support for commercial rent tendencies. Um, uh, for anyone in experiencing 70% lower uh, drop in income levels. That's, you know, significant uh, amount of money that's been put into the system um, uh, because of the ability for our government to react to a tough economic time. And I think that's what we need to do is we need to make sure that we have the opportunity um, that uh, we're spending the money where we need to. Um, and that doesn't mean the project's done. It, it means that it had to be put on pause at that time, and we're going to continue to advocate for it. Um, uh, in the future to see how we can kind of get a solution. Now we look at the post-COVID world uh, or during the COVID world, and we see not just from, you know, uh, not in specifically to this question, but you see how teaching has changed at universities. So a lot more of an online presence even. Um, uh, you, you see a lot of universities uh, or even students that are a bit uneasy going back uh, into big lecture halls. Uh, you know, they want to see more of the technology uh, implemented in it. So, you know, our world has totally changed post-COVID. Uh, in any, you know, directive of any economy or sector of the economy that you look at. Well, I'm glad to hear that the universities are now completely off the table. Uh, how, what do you think? How will COVID-19 affect the 2022 elections uh, in Ontario? 
Look, right now, it's, uh, you know, for us, it's it's really focused on, you know, let's solve the issues at hand right now. Like COVID is still amongst us. It's still a very, you know, serious issue. Of course, as, as a politician, as an individual, you're thinking about you know, re-election. But right now for us, it's 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 primary focus is to be um, supporting small, like for me, is to support small businesses in my community of Smith and Smith to make sure everyone is healthy, safe, has access uh, to whatever they need. You look at testing, you know, we've got some of the best testing, uh, you know, for example, William Oster has done the most tests in the entire uh, province uh, of Ontario. Uh, so making sure that, you know, because, you know, COVID's got a bit of a hot spot in the Peel region, um, that we have the the necessary tools, the necessary health care there uh, to be able to address those concerns, to have the testing capacity, to have the tests available. That's right now my, my main priority. We want to make sure That's people excellent. are back up on their feet thousands and millions of people across this province have lost their jobs and it's really about getting this economy back on track what do you hope to achieve for the remainder of 2020 and you, you answered that a little bit in your uh previous uh statement but uh what's that you know one or two things you really hope to achieve for the remainder of these uh five six months of 2020 i really think right now um we really got to get our economy back on track businesses have taken a huge toll COVID has taken a huge toll on our small businesses and our small businesses are the backbone of this economy. So I've got my hands full in trying to make sure that we create the right environment for growth, uh, economic growth in our province. And, and I'm really interested in doing that. And I, that's what I really want to focus on because we know with a strong, you know, the foundations of a strong economy for a rebound will benefit the people of Ontario. We need to get more people working. Millions of people are without their jobs right now in the province, uh, in, in, the, in the country, sorry. Um, and that's unacceptable. And I think, you know, under the leadership of Premier Ford, our focus on, you know, made in Ontario products, our focus on making sure that people get back on their feet. This is going to be imperative for the next couple of months to make sure people are back on their feet, people are back working uh, and contributing in the economy. That's going to, I think, be one of the, the key parts of it. And along with that, making sure that we, you know, keep a strong healthcare system to keep everybody safe uh, and sound. Prab. Thank you so much for your time. I know you were in a legislative legislator, uh, meeting, uh, but thank you so much for your time. And hopefully we'll do this again whenever you have an announcement. We'd love to have you back on the show. There you have it, the Assistant Minister of Small Businesses and Red Tape Production uh, and also MPP of Brampton South, uh, Prab Meet Sarkaria. Thank you so much, Prab. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sammy. I really appreciate it. There you have it. There you have it. Keep watching uh, House of Politics on Canada One TV. If you guys have any questions or concerns, email us at info at CanadaOne.tv or leave your comments in the box below because I love reading your comments. Thank you very much. जैसे जैसे कारोबार दोबारा खुल रहे हैं जिस्मानी दूरी की मश्क जारी रखें और अक्सर अपने हाथ धोएं कोविड-19 के फैलाव को रोकने में मदद करें ontario.ca/coronavirus देखें यह इश्तेहार हुकूमत ऑन्टेरियो ने जारी किया है